Time is a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective, hosted by Tim Ullman and Jack Caliber. The ULC envisions a future in which all congregations fully equip the priesthood of all believers through world-class leadership development at the local level. Lead Time taps into biblical wisdom for practical solutions to today's burning issues. Each podcast confronts real-time struggles facing the local church in a post-Christian culture. Step into the action with the ULC at uniteleadership.org. This is Lead Time. Welcome to Lead Time. Tim Allman here. Jack Kalberg will be back uh, next week. He's on vacation. Today, I get the privilege of hanging out with uh, Pastor Mark Renner. Let me tell you about this brother. I heard about him uh, from my friend Ben Haupt, who is a professor at Concordia Seminary. And, and Mark was actually one of his students. And Mark was designing all of these kind of case studies. He'd had experience in the church uh, before becoming a pastor. And y- you can't you can't make up a number of the stories, the strange things, the beautiful <laughs> things that happen in the in the local parish. And so I think with the inspiration of uh, Professor Haupt and others, Mark uh, wrote a book called Curious Cases, a series of short pastoral case studies. So let me tell you just a little bit more about Mark. He's an associate pastor at St. Mark's Lutheran Church in Janesville, Wisconsin. He served for a brief stint in Cleveland, Ohio. He's been a pastor since 2021. Before attending seminary, he he served, and you're going to hear in his story, uh, served internationally. He's uh, served in unique roles here in the United States within uh, congregations. He loves also spending time with his wife, uh, Dana, and uh, they have uh, three Three little ones. Uh, one little one is now with the Lord, and maybe we'll get into that story. But he also has uh, two two little ones as well, uh, still alive and kicking. Dimitri and Andre are follower, young followers of Jesus in in the uh, Renner household. What a joy to be with you today, Mark. Uh, thank you, thank you for your generosity of spirit, your generosity of using your gifts uh, to elevate the name of Christ. And I'm pumped to get to learn with you today. So how you doing, bro? Just before we get into the conversation, doing all right? Oh, thank you so much for having me, Tim. I'm doing really well. And it's a joy. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, man. All right. So let's talk about the book. Uh, What led you kind of into the ministry, into seminary, tell a little bit of that story, and then to say, you know what, let's write a book called Curious Cases. Super cool. I love it. Absolutely. So uh, growing up, my dad was a non-denominational pastor for about a decade. He and my mom planted a church in Ohio. And growing up, I never thought I would be a pastor. You know, oh, that's cool that dad does that. You know, I'm not going to do that. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, grew up believing in Jesus, knowing about Jesus, being baptized, so on and so forth as a child. But I really had a very vivid encounter with Jesus when I was in high school and it was at my home church, St. John's. And then that led me to want to pursue possibly mission work. And then I was out of high school for a little bit, not quite a year. And I went over to mainland China, did mission work there for about six months. That was a fantastic experience. Then I came home. And I was uh, really interested in studying theology. And when I was in China, people were saying, oh, Mark, you should think about being a pastor. You seem to have some of those gifts. And I was like, all right, cool. I'll check this out. So I majored in theology at Concordia Ann Arbor, did sports, did drama there. And then right after graduating, instead of going to seminary, I went to Hong Kong and it wasn't far from where I was in mainland China, but it was a world apart, very different place, very different feel. And, uh, you know, there were some similarities, but the way I would describe it is tropical Chinese New York. That's how I would describe (laughs) Hong Kong, basically. So cool. And we have the Missouri Senate has a big sister church presence there with the schools, churches, so on and so forth. And the ELCA does as well. And then I came home. I was basically a DCE for two and a half, three years at my home church, but I wasn't rostered. So uh, I wasn't technically a DCE, right? But I essentially was doing that and then spent a year taking some introductory courses at an ELCA seminary in Columbus. Uh, my advisor there, Dr. Powell, he, he's taught classes at various times at St. Louis Seminary. He's right in your area. He's in, I think he's in Mesa. And I think he's the best New Testament scholar in the world. I really do. And um, he's amazing. And then I went to St. Louis Seminary, had an amazing time there. 
And then I became a pastor and been a pastor for about three and a half years. So that's awesome. Before we get into the, because this is a podcast of the ULC and we're members of the LCMS, what led you then? Sure. You, you were raised kind of non denom your dad said. How did you find out about kind of conservative Lutheranism? Conservative Lutheranism. Yeah. Well, I, basically, we were Missouri Synod going way back. I have a direct ancestor that was a disciple of Leah, and he founded a church um, in Marysville, Ohio. Uh, his name was Hans Rausch. And so my family, we actually, Marysville, St. John's Marysville is an original six. It's older than the Missouri Senate, actually. So my family had always been Missouri Senate mainly uh, on my dad's side. And pretty much during, as I understand, the uh, late 70s, things were a little bit weird in Lutheranism. So for a time, he was non-denominational, but always effectively Lutheran. Sure. And we came back, uh, you know, my grandpa, everybody else in my family had never become non-denom, you know. And um, so anyway, no, that's that basically sense. how that took place. And, uh, you know, friends and uh, the ELCA as well. But, yeah, I'm Missouri Senate. I, yeah. You know, I didn't become ELCA when I took five courses at a ELCA seminary. I mean, half the professors at Fort Wayne and St. Louis both got their PhDs from Notre Dame. Right. I mean, um, we don't Roman Catholic, <laughs> Notre Dame. You know, so I guess it's sort of uh, sort of odd. Um, some people thought, "Oh, are you L- ELC?" I'm like, "No, I'm I'm Missouri Senate." Yeah, we're we're kind of tribal in many respects, and unfortunately, the residue of Seminex there in the <laughs> the late seventies, uh, had some residual damage where uh, I know a number of leaders who said, I don't know how this church body is going to work this out. I still have very conservative word and sacrament based Lutheran catechetical beliefs. Uh, but in right. terms of the Missouri Synod, this is a very tough season. One of my friends, Gary Kinneman, who was mm-hmm. a, he was a graduate at um, Concordia uh, there in St. John's in Winfield, Kansas. He ended up, right. he's got a long line, just like, just like you. And he ended up starting an, a non-denom church that became a mega multi, multi thousand member church here in, in Mesa. Right. Arizona. Anyway, so there's there's a number of those stories. All that to say, Mark, I'm glad you're a part of the Missouri Synod for sure. We need we need uh, leaders like you, passionate leaders. So let's get into the book. You have 15 themes in these yes. curious cases, and uh, there are so many. Some of the chapters are you know maybe like a half a page to a page, and others are maybe a couple four pages. You know, any ranging from two hundred words probably to like a thousand word kind of kind of case studies. Tell us how you narrowed in on your themes, like caring for the poor, conflict resolution, racism, raising children, etc. And are there any themes that you would have like looking back now maybe included? I thought your umbrella themes were fantastic, by the way. So yeah, just just tell a little bit of the origin story of the book. Yeah, so basically, uh, under the new curriculum at Concordia Seminary St. Louis, we really need case studies. So I was the first class to be a part of that new curriculum. I wrote a case study for a pastoral leadership class, my last class at Concordia Seminary with Ben Haupt. Uh, I wrote it, emailed it to him, and then he emailed me back and he said, Mark, that is one of the funniest things I have ever read in my entire life. I was laughing so hard that faculty and staff were coming into my office to make sure I was okay. He said, if that's real, uh, then wow. If that isn't real, then wow. You should try to get it published either way. And then I started speaking with him and I said, well, I'm actually thinking about writing a book of these case studies using the Harvard case study model uh, guidelines. And he said, you know, that's really interesting you say that because we really need case studies under the new curriculum here at St. Louis. And, you know, I think they'd be great for circuit meetings and conferences and so on and so forth. And I was like, all right, cool, you know, and I I think I was ready to do it either way. But then that encouragement sort of put me over the top. So, yeah, but I've been writing for years. I wrote hundreds upon hundreds of short stories that aren't published while I was in Hong Kong. I would go and... uh, you know, chill out in uh, Mong Kok and write case studies like all night. Mong Kok's basically a city within Hong Kong. So, yeah. 
That's so that's so cool. So how did you develop the kind of themes? I mean, caring for the poor is where you start conflict resolution. We're going to get into a number of these and maybe you can even Mm -hmm. summarize some of the case studies and we can we can talk it through pastorally. But yeah, tell the origin story of the themes. Yeah. So the all the themes are things that I think the church is encountering or in some cases maybe isn't crazy about encountering. If you think about it, Tim, a huge portion of the world is poor, desperately poor. Maybe not starving to death, but is pretty poor, right on um, a razor's edge, you know, struggling with hunger. Uh, So I said, well, you have to write something about caring for the poor. And we have a fair amount of poor people in this country as well, but all over the world. And, you know, there's a there's a chapter on dealing with racism. There's racism in this world uh, directed at people of different races and backgrounds and ethnicities. And I've seen it all over the world. It's not just here in the United States, you know, and it doesn't mean that there hasn't been some progress in this country. You know, I think there certainly has. If somebody says. Well, race relations are as bad as they were in 1951. I really don't think so. I really don't think that's accurate. But is there still some degree of racism in the world or our own country? Sure. Yeah. You know, and as a member of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church, that means all races, genders, backgrounds, ages, so on and so forth. There's no room for racism in the in the Christian church, the Holy Catholic Church, you know, universal church. That's how I'm using that term. So that's where that came from. And then I thought, you know, I kind of have a lot of experience in rural settings and in urban settings. So I should write about both of those. I have a lot of experience with youth ministry. They truly came up just sort of organically. I would think of a couple of case studies. And I'd be like, well, that can't be be in, you know, pastoral counseling, or it'd be tough to kind of figure out how to put it in there or how to put it in rural and small town ministry, I should come up with a new chapter. And originally, I think I was going to go with like eight chapters, then it turned into 10, then eventually 15. And I was like, should I go for 20? And I said, no, I'll leave it at 15 <laughs> and in each chapter. Yeah, so that's what happened. Oh, that may, yeah, that that's fantastic. I'm way into conflict resolution, so I I really dug into those big time. I yeah. think those uh, those case studies have some catalytic potential for us because uh, ministry is very very messy. Before we get into you know some higher level kind of conversations, what case study did you find the funniest? And I'm going to tell you which one I found the funniest. All it right. was a a cry from a cry from Tuggle. Uh, that was a very cringy, like funny. Right. Tell about the cry from Tuggle, and then any other ones that you kind of found humorous. And I'm I was interested as your. Did you just make that story up, or is that an actual story? So I would say that's a dramatization. Okay. So about one third of these, Tim, just to give the listeners uh, some perspective on how these came about, one third, probably about fifty, are almost exact retellings of an event. And I change the names. I don't use any specific places, but I would say a solid 50 are almost verbatim retelling. Another 50 are dramatizations of two or three events. And I believe dramatic events are true. I mean, I think Jim Veltz has talked about this quite a bit. You know, there's drama in the Gospel of Mark. That's right. Where he believes, he teaches that there are situations where, you know, Three Pharisees came into the room and said this to Jesus, and then five came in like a minute later. So instead of saying, you know, using both of those examples, he just says a crowd came in for the sake of time and space. To me, that's absolutely true. And that's kind of what I did with another 50 where I took uh, something that I saw in Hong Kong And I combined that with when I was studying in London with something that I saw at my first call. So two or three events combined. To me, that's truthful. And that's kind of what I did with the cry from Tuggle. And um, then there is another 50 where, no, I have not seen this firsthand. But uh, like I wrote one in here, which is not a funny one based on what I think would have happened if, let's say, the Zodiac killer towards the end of his life would have repented and spoken with a pastor about that. This is how I imagine that would have played out. Hmm. Now, those are the ones, you know, that you could say are farthest from the truth. But even those, I think, are truthful. 
you know, I think this is how it likely would have played out or we can imagine it would have played out. So a cry from Tuggle is basically, you know, I guess I can tell you about a lot of stories where there are older people, faithful in the church, love Jesus, and it's tough getting older. It is tough. And they don't want to stop serving the Lord. They have amazing hearts for Jesus. And I combined about two or three stories that I knew of where you have an organist going up the stairs and he's playing, but he doesn't want to get back downstairs to use the restroom. So he relieves himself in mason jars, basically. And this is discovered by a janitor and by an elder. And then there's kind of a conflict where one of the elders is like, you know, janitor, I think his name was Mr. Frito. Mr. Frito, you are done here. Like, you are not going to be a janitor. You knew about this. You didn't report it. And then the pastor is sort of caught in the middle. You know, basically, these are about healthy boundaries, too, Tim. Yep. These are about healthy boundaries. How do you maintain healthy boundaries? How do you make responsible decisions with only limited information? How do you make a well-rounded, responsible decision uh, based on limited information? Yeah. That's based on what these kids are about. And how do we relate the faith to the needs of the time, to quote Herman Zaze? Yeah, amen. I want to get into boundaries and and kind of conflict and maybe relational triangles for sure. But before we do that, is there one from you that you're like, this is the funniest one that and or the one that Ben Howe found funny? Yeah, (laughs) I would say it's the first one in the chapter on separation and divorce, and it's entitled Johnny and Martha Binks. And that was the one that Ben thought was so hilarious. And that to me is a funny one because basically you have this couple, the, I think the gentleman has been divorced like four times and the lady has been divorced three times and, you know, not hating on people have been divorced by any stretch of the imagination. It's not really so much that as it is their kind of characters, very strong in their advice and their opinion. It's questionable whether or not they should be teaching a Bible study. But the thing is like many past, Pastors. We have pastors that are overworked and they don't know who to rely on. They don't have an associate pastor. They don't have a DCE. They're not sure if they can continue to have elders because there's so few people maybe wanting to serve as elders in some of our ch- some churches. Right. So he asks this couple to, you know, teach this Bible study and uh some, you know, some interesting things come about where they basically are advising this large group to follow their hearts wherever it leads. And someone, you know, kind of challenges them on that, a young man who's newly married. And he says, you know, well, how can you say it's wrong for someone to be gay, but then you're promoting divorce? You know, how can you do that? Like, And he tells them off, basically, Johnny does. So to me, that's the funniest one. It just feels so real. And it feels like something I have heard or seen in some form a thousand times where you have people, again, not hating on people who are divorced at all, Tim, but, you know, they've been, they're like on their fifth marriage, but then they're just so hard on, you know, gay people or whatever, or on, you know, whatever it is. Um, like, hmm, you know, yeah. can you kind of see yourself for a second and maybe how, you know, maybe you need some work on yourself or we all do. We all need God's grace. So that would probably be the funniest one to me. I don't know, Mark, that there's anything messier than being a parish pastor I, because of, I mean, no. we're an open place. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully our churches are open places where they're hurting the marginalized uh those that are EGRs, right? Extra grace required. Like they find a home here. They find a, a faithful family here, a Jesus filled family. And if, if you, cause it's much easier, let's just go down this line of thinking. It's much easier for us to be a pastor and say, or, or just a congregation member and say, right. we're a church for these types of people. I really yeah. liked, I really liked your, your uh, case study on uh, a pastor. Are you a liberal or a Democrat? You know, like you say certain things that sound like you're a Democrat and other things sound like you're a Republican, you know, and and just that's real life for us. What is it about the the local church that is so beautiful and yet so, so messy, uh, Mark, in your experience? Yeah, I would say, you know, as Lutherans, so 
what's really interesting or paradoxical is we believe so strongly. It's everywhere in our confessions and our beliefs. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. In fact, that's why I'm Lutheran, because I think on the teaching of justification, we have it by the grace of God, as close to perfect as you can have it, by grace alone, through faith alone, and Jesus Christ alone. Mm. So with that teaching permeating everything we say and do, at least on paper, at least on paper, you're going to get all kinds of wonderful, strange, odd, beautiful people coming to your church, coming to your congregation. But then we have kind of a specific way of doing things, sort of. Mm -hmm. And we believe in, you know, doing things in an order, the right order, not getting things out of place. So then, you know, people come in and they're filled with this grace, but sometimes it's like, well, how do we relate this now? Or how do we work together now? And I guess in general pastoral ministry in the parish, you know, I try to explain it to people. And there are times where like, I can talk with my mom or my sister who are social workers. And it's like, yeah, there's some overlap there. And then I'll talk to someone and they're like, well, it's kind of like you're a counselor. It's like, yeah, but we're not, you know, officially counselors. We do pastoral counseling. Kind of like you're a CEO, kind of. But then again, it's not exactly a business. The closest thing I would liken it to, Tim, I go back to CFW Walther. The pastor is a doctor of the soul. Yeah, That's the Think when you look at our education level, like you and I, we spent like 10 years in school, a oh, decade wow. in school. That's great. Being a pastor is the most fantastic job in the world. Um, but there are challenges. You're trying to care for the whole person in Jesus Christ. And sometimes you're working with someone and their heart faith doesn't connect to their head faith and their head faith doesn't connect to their soul and their soul doesn't connect always um, perfectly with their heart, so on and so forth. So I would say that makes it a little bit messy. We're trying to care for this incredibly diverse group of people. And we ourselves are also in need of a doctor, but mm. then Christ using us as a doctor of the soul. I don't oh. know if that. Well, no. But. Yeah. That's so good. You know, the difference is you were talking about, well, you're a counselor or you're a sh the thing about like counseling is counselors don't probably see your people with other people every, hopefully every single week. Right. We're, a, right. we're available with people on a, on a rotation. There's a rhythm of, of spending time doing life with one another that just leads inevitably, inevitably to conflict. So, cause you're yeah. going to have, I, I got to, at any given time, in, in the pair, and it's not just in a large congregation, it's small, it doesn't matter. Anytime people, two or more, are gathering in the name of Jesus, there's going to be right. inevitable conflict. So, what have you learned about conflict resolution and boundary setting and, and really triangles and not being triangulated consistently? Because that's where a pastor finds himself. I got a text uh, this last Sunday. Uh, let me just give you a case study. Uh, in real life right now, Mark. I mean, uh, we've had an issue at Christ Greenfield of not having enough Eucharistic assistance. And wow. the um, uh, there's, there is supposed to be a, a sheet, mm -hmm. a master list, you know, but yeah. it doesn't get filled in. And so some Sundays I or whoever the other pastor is kind of overseeing the table, we're yeah. kind of like, uh, hey, Paul, uh, hey, uh, Bob, I know you guys have done this before. Would you come up? Well, it's gotten to a tipping point right now where um, there's name calling against the people. I got a text, a really angry text from a guy saying, mm -hmm. I'm leaving the church because of the distraction, the disrespect to the elements. And I'm like, I have like I'm not in charge of like putting right. together that list. We're working on it here, you know, but it's just it's just right. really messy. And some things that, um, you know, are, are a big deal to you are not a big deal to other people and vice versa. So just talk about yeah. conflict and, and uh, good boundary setting as a pastor in the local parish, bud. Absolutely. So, you know, someone comes to me and they say, you know, hey, so-and-so is thinking this way. And, you know, I, I think you should know this and that. And it's like, well, just tell them to come talk with me about it. Thanks for letting me you know. Just tell them to come and talk with me. You know, we want to follow Matthew 18. And uh, thanks a lot. And I think a lot of times people sort of need to be heard. So I think a lot of de-escalating and working with conflict is just sort of a ministry of presence, I think. 
and hearing someone speak their piece and say, you know, I feel this way, I feel that way. And trying to lead them through, you know, forgiveness, being able to forgive themselves, being able to forgive others. And something I've been wondering about is maybe I should be using from time to time the Lutheran service book. We do believe in individual confession and absolution. I would say a lot of our churches, whether they're more, you know, traditional or contemporary or whatever it is, I don't know that a ton of our churches do that. You know, and uh, but just kind of going up and saying, hey, I broke the eighth commandment. Will you please forgive me? You know, and yes, you're forgiven. Jesus forgives you. So I guess uh, I would say, you know, making sure people realize that we're going to try to follow Matthew 18 the best we can do. I will need forgiveness sometimes. You will need forgiveness. We're going to talk this through. We're going to listen to one another. But, uh, you know, speak to the person directly if you can. Yeah. And sometimes it's a fine line between seeking wise counsel and gossiping. That's right. You know? Yeah. No, that's, that's so good. Uh, I, I've come to think that, and I think Luther said this too, that all of life is confession and absolution. And the quicker I can own my contribution to whatever the struggle is, uh, yep. the better one of, I'm going to get up to 30,000 feet in terms of, um, the LCMS. I don't right. know. I don't know that we're modeling confession and absolution, um, in between institutions, between leaders and, and between, between pastors. And I think that's where it has to start right now. And we have to acknowledge right. that Satan wants me to be a coward and not have mm-hmm. the difficult conversation. Right. right. And he wants me to talk about so-and-so to so-and-so. Why am I doing that? To alleviate my own anxiety. Right. Because mm-hmm. it's going to be painful to go there, but I need to disperse it. Um, and there's a lot of soft people around here who mainly agree with me. And so off, off we go. If we just started, because I can't be a good pastor in a local right. church and have an underbelly of people who are discontent. Why? Cause there's going to form different tribes and the church is going to inevitably be split. So we've got to, if you're a local pastor, like this is one of the main skills that we have to develop. And it is a skill that needs to be developed, managing self, breathing, <laughs> trying to find the peaceful place so I can think clearly to right. uh, take the the monkey that you've tried to place on my back and put it right back on your back. Because Jesus and the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you, they want to help you have that courageous conversation with that next person. But often pastors and maybe even denominational leaders, you can take that monkey and try to solve something that you shouldn't be trying to solve. If we're going to solve anything, it's going to be bringing two disparate parties together so they can confess on their contribution and forgive one another in the name of Christ. It seems I may be simplistic, but it seems like that would help in the Missouri Synod context if leaders would step up toward that direction. Any thoughts there, Mark? Absolutely. You know, um, reach out to the brother that you're concerned with. Mm -hmm. Reach out to that person directly. Don't let this play out online where you're you know, not just generally talking about problems. That's one thing. I mean, that's kind of what we're doing here, you know, but when, where I think it crosses a line, you have not reached out to someone and you are specifically talking about that person or possibly calling them a heretic because they're doing something that seems to be heterodox or slightly off or whatever it is. That's where I think a lot of problems come up. We are one in the body of Christ. Uh, You know, both of our seminaries are rooted in Jesus's forgiveness and his grace. All of our congregations should be. Uh, Give me a call, private message me or I'll private message you. I cringe when I see people who are brothers or sisters in Christ being called heretics online or whatever it is, that is not okay. I think that's grieving to the Holy Spirit, grieving to Jesus Christ. And Tim, I also wonder what are non-Christians thinking? Not good. Are they wondering, especially like people who aren't connected to a church, but maybe they're thinking about attending a church or thinking about going to St. Mark or Christ Greenfield. They might be wondering, you know, wow, why would I want to be a part of that? They can't even forgive one another. They're both pastors. This is so bizarre. So 
have a frank, difficult conversation. We have security in our baptisms to have tough conversations and talk about tough things. And that's what I tried to do in the book, Curious Cases. That's what I tried to do in my ministry in general. It's like, no, you're a baptized child of God, whether you live in rural Wyoming or whether you're in Albany, New York. No, you're a baptized child of God, whether you're in Phoenix or whether you're in Janesville, Wisconsin. So let's have a tough conversation. Maybe there is something I need to repent of. You know, I don't know. Tell me, you know, tell me you're being led by Jesus the same as I am, you know, but please don't put on a blog that's being shared by three of your friends, you know, that you think this person is a heretic or a snake or something. Yeah. I just think that's awful. Yeah, absolutely. I'm with and, you. you know, as men, as men who are leading the church, I should have the guts to talk to you in person. Yeah. You know, if I don't have the guts to do that, that's maybe a sign that there's something going on with me. Uh, and if I'm not ready to pray about it. Yeah. And if you feel compelled to post something, talk to the person instead. Amen. Yeah, that's what I would say. That's it. That's it. It feels like healing could come to our church body and to the church at large if we modeled uh, confession and absolution. You know, I mean, that's what that's what Jesus did. Jesus did not shy yeah. away from difficult conversations. <laughs> like he he said he very did. hard things to the Pharisees to their face when the early church yeah. was trying to figure it out. And and uh, this is the book of Galatians. Paul says, "I went to Peter. I opposed him to his faith, <laughs> his face, because what he was saying was uh, grieving the Holy Spirit was counter to the message of of Christ. Like that is largely it was a messy relational thing, crossing from yeah. Jewish traditions to Gentile traditions and bringing the gospel. This is what the Holy Spirit gives us wisdom to do is to handle difficult conversations. And to summarize, your book is really all about that. Let's just talk about." different topics that you're going to face and let's do yep. it as brothers in the ministry and come to a place of, of reconciliation. Um, because if we don't, if we hide from these tough topics, the, the mission of Jesus is going to be hampered. That's what I really think your book is. If I'm going to summarize it, that's, that's kind of the core heart of your bu- bookmark. And I love it. Any response there? Thank you, Tim. It's real life. And if someone reads it, they will realize pretty quickly, like, I'm not a pietistic or puritanical person. So if there's a Christian that smokes cigarettes that I'm writing about, I don't omit that or write like a preface where I'm like apologizing that he smokes cigarettes, you know. Now, I understand kids don't smoke. If any kids are listening, don't smoke cigarettes. I don't. <laughs> Thanks for that, Mark. But somebody, but I feel like so many Christian writings, for instance, like they wouldn't even put that in yeah. or they would admit that or they would apologize or something where, yeah, that's the real world. That's real life. Or if you have somebody who lives in a state where they have a medical marijuana card and their doctor has prescribed that for them, I put that in as well. That's a lot of people I know. A lot of people I know have medical marijuana licenses. I don't, you know, <laughs> but, um, and I'm not trying to encourage kids to smoke marijuana again, Thanks. but could someone be a Christian and live in Michigan and have a medical marijuana license? Yes, they could. And I try <laughs> to engage in real life. This is what you're actually going to be encountering. And I think sometimes what happens a little bit, Tim, is maybe at colleges or seminaries, not even talking specifically about the Missouri Senate, although it could be. Sometimes, you know, you have these guys, they're young, they go from never having been an adult leader in their congregation when they go to seminary to all of the sudden being an adult leader in their uh in their context, in their congregation, where they are pastoring that church, they're pastoring that group. That's the first time they're an adult in their congregation. And sometimes I think professors are telling them stories where, you know, uh, something from the late 80s or the early 90s happened. And it's good information, but maybe not all of that is completely relevant to what's happening now in 2024. Fair enough. Fair enough. That's why uh, the institutions and professors need pastors who are on the ground, who have been seasoned through it all. And, and pastors, yeah. we need, we need the resident theologians that are in our church body. I'm praying for 
a tighter partnership right. there. So let's get into pastoral formation because that's really sure. what this is about. You wrote this largely for the 25 to maybe 35 year old pastor who is just trying to figure it out, recognizing they heard some things that were black and white and now you're with with messy people and it's more gray so what let's talk the character of the leader right now the character of the pastor what do you think are the top three characteristics of an effective pastor especially here in 2024 i would say it's the same as what luther um described uh what makes a pastor is temptation meditation and prayer and temptation is also suffering or experience And, you know, Luther expresses concern about people entering ministry too young. He talks about this. I believe it's in his commentary on Galatians. I love Luther. I absolutely love Luther and I love reading Luther. So, um, you know, I would say that's what makes a scholar. That's what makes a pastor. That's what makes a scholar effectively take that head knowledge and put it into real life practice is temptation, meditation, and prayer. And you don't get those things if you're not engaging the real world, if you're not engaging real things. And temptation, uh, suffering, experience, that produces character. I don't know if there's anything more important than that in pastoral formation, in my opinion. And the more experience you get, you realize things like, hey, golly, every time Jesus had a big ministry event, right before or right after, he takes some time to rest. In order for me to grow, I need to rest because I'm not going to be any good if I'm burnt out. Like, yes, we should work hard. We should work very hard, but we still need rest. If Jesus rested, then I definitely need rest him. And I'm guessing you do, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you think about stories that you hear about people getting in, um, you know, horrible plane wrecks or, or car wrecks. And there are these experienced pilots or drivers. You think. How did that happen? He's so experienced and like he did four or five things wrong that like a rookie driver, rookie pilot would have known. And then you find out, oh, he had been working nonstop and traveling internationally for like four or five days and he had like no sleep. Mm. And that's when he made that mistake. Okay. And I also feel like a lot of pastors I know that have made really bad mistakes. It's like, oh, he's been working 80 hours a week for two years straight and going on like no sleep. And then he did that. And that was really stupid and really sinful or whatever it was. But I can kind of understand what happened. He was completely burnt out. All right. Gotcha. Oh, I love that. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about because you kind of moved into meditation and prayer. And when I think of meditation, I do mm-hmm. think of self-care. I think of time alone, time set apart with the Lord. And then this yeah. constant kind of pray, I, I think of prayer more as then like discernment and yeah. this ongoing dialogue with the, with the Lord. Uh, but before you get to any of that, I think you really, you didn't say this, but you're really talking the way of the cross, the way of the way of suffering. And to be honest, that if you, cause I remember hearing this when I, when I got out, you're going to face really, really hard stuff. There's going to be trauma to you right. and around you. And unless yeah. you work from that place of, of health and listening first to the Holy spirit and then deeply listening to others, you're going to succumb to the temptation and not trust in the one who will give you the right words and the right posture when the inevitable moment of, of struggle comes, when the grieving family who is at an absolute loss just needs your, your presence and no kind of pithy sayings. They need the depth of the presence of Christ that flows from you to, to that person. So just say a little bit more about the way of the cross and suffering connected to temptation and, and even how a pastor can build the, that resilience muscle, because I think that's really what it is, that resilience posture as they embrace and even take on the suffering of and suffer with uh, those that are that are suffering. Amen. Well, what I would say is a temptation we all have is to try to justify God. Well, you lost this child, so you could have another child then. You wouldn't have had a child so soon if you hadn't lost that child. Well, That car wreck happened where those kids died in that bus wreck. So, you know, there would be better safety laws on the road. 
we don't need to do any of that. We don't need to justify God. Sometimes God is silent. Mm -hmm. Sometimes God is silent in the midst of our pain and our suffering. And when we suffer, Tim, God is the same place that he was when his son was being crucified on the cross. So as pastors, let's just be real. Be there for people. Have a ministry of presence. Let's not sugarcoat this. This situation sucks. I am a little bit upset with God that this 16-year-old boy died in a car wreck. I'm kind of really upset with God. But I know that God's wrath has been poured out on Jesus Christ yes. on the cross. That is the greatest thing that Jesus ever did by far. The greatest miracle he ever did was die on that cross. And without his death, there's no resurrection. The greatest thing he ever did was die and rise again for the sins of all people. All we need to do is simply believe. So in tragedy, in death, in heartache, as Lutherans, as Christians in general, but I think very much as Lutherans, we're there for the people. We don't, you know, give them some sort of cute cookie cutter little answer. Uh, you know, maybe we don't say much at all. But we are angry with them. We are disturbed with them. We are upset with them. And we live life with them, you know, and we point them to Jesus, his death, his suffering, his resurrection. And we point to the resurrection of the dead on the last day because his tomb is empty, Tim. Hospital beds are going to be empty because his tomb is empty. Graves are going to be empty. That's the hope we have as Christians. There's a lot. There's a ton. I don't know about God and I don't know about Jesus. And some of these prayers, like kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Some will be answered in our lifetime in front of us, but others we won't see until the last day when Jesus comes back. I love that. What you did in a very normal pastoral way is distinguish the hidden and revealed will of God. Mm -hmm. And we, we move from what is hidden or from what is hidden, I don't know, to what is revealed, Christ and him crucified, raised from the dead, the, the hope that yep. is ours to come on the last day when Jesus returns. I mean, it's so, it's so beautiful. I don't have much more than that, but that the gospel is more than enough, more than it's more enough. than so more than amen. So let's go the inverse in terms of pastoral formation. Uh, what, negative characteristics and none of us we're all works in progress we got gifts we got gaps uh, but if there are some strong gaps that you would hope are not seen in pastors and uh, negative characteristics what would two or three of those be mark oh my goodness tim um we tend to be people that struggle with loneliness i would say mm. it can be lonely you know you hear um you hear these stories about former presidents that were rivals, but then they become best friends when they leave office, yeah. even though, you know, one is a Democrat, one's libertarian, one's Republican. It's because, oh, you can relate to what I'm going through. And pastors so often, you know, and it's not like poor pastor, poor me, but they struggle with loneliness. They've had to move a lot. It's been tough for them to form really solid foundational relationships in the communities that they live in. Sometimes they can't even afford to live in the community that they serve in because it's so expensive and they feel kind of isolated. They feel kind of detached. The other part is you know, you spend a lot of time. I spent a lot of time. I'm guessing you did, too. I know you did uh, in book work, doing great academic work. And that's important. That's needed. But sometimes maybe your social skills, uh, just in general, not everyone, but maybe your social skills get a little bit stunted as a result of that. You kind of get out of the habit of talking to people that haven't studied Latin and Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew and all of these, you know, German, all these languages. And um, they're just normal people, you know. So I would say loneliness. And I would say in some cases, like a lack of connection with maybe the real world a little bit or and then also meeting people that, you know, uh, they're very professional people. They've done academic work. Maybe they don't have faith and you love these people, but they kind of see you as like, uh, you know, maybe not having a real degree or something like that or a real job. And then I would also say, lastly, you and I and basically all pastors in the United States, we're living in two realities, two time zones, the secular time zone and the Western Catholic Christian 
time zone where it's like, oh, okay, you're going to that concert at the United Center until three in the morning on a Saturday. I'd love to go. I can't. I've got church in the morning. Like, I can't. I can't do that. You know, like, oh, like, well, maybe you can call off and come back for this. And it's like, I want to. I've already missed my two Sundays for the year or whatever it is. So there's a pull there. I would say in general, the biggest thing would probably be loneliness that a lot of pastors face. It's the greatest blessing in the world being a pastor of not asking for like pity or anything like that but that and i would say you know um just maybe not having a ton of real life experience in some cases because we've spent so much time in undergrad and seminary building up to be these well-trained pastors and theologians and in our various um, callings and settings and I guess the segue to something, Tim, that's kind of who I wrote this book for. You know, if I had a person in mind, I'll just make up a name. Let's say Bobby Schmidt. Bobby Schmidt grew up at a congregation in Grand Rapids, Michigan. They have three full-time pastors. They have a full-time DCE, two full-time secretaries, a full-time worship director, you know, one of the healthiest churches you'll ever see. Then he went to seminary at either Fort Wayne or St. Louis or wherever he went to seminary. Well, before that, he goes to undergrad, right? And he meets his wife there, beautiful wife. They get married in uh, the chapel at Seward, and then they go to Fort Wayne or St. Louis. And then for Vicarage, they go to King of Kings. And everybody loves them, and they're encouraging them. And then a year later, Bobby and his beautiful wife and their baby get a, well, Bobby gets called to Wrath of God Lutheran <laughs> in this just totally messed up place. Crime is through the roof. Uh, they've had eight pastors in 10 years. The last pastor has changed his name on his social media accounts. No one knows where he is. He's just left town. He's not in ministry anymore. And um, they have 10 people there each week. They're expecting him to fix everything for them. You know, that's kind of extreme, right? That's kind of an extreme example. But we have a lot of guys that go from being in pretty healthy, solid, supportive situations to all of a sudden being like, you're going to fix all our problems for us. You're going to do it all. And, you know, uh, you might need to be on food stamps because we're not able to really pay you or something like that. And that's their call for their first two, three, four years of ministry. So that's yeah. kind of who I or we're not in the church triumphant time anymore. We're not Tim, we're not even in the late eighties anymore. Right. Or early nineties, like, and we're definitely not in the nineteen fifties. It's changed so much. And I think the societal kind of whiplash for a lot of a lot of pastors, because there are some churches in the Midwest that are kind of in a time warp for lack of a yep. better term. And and so right. it, it still feels like the church is the majority and, and church can kind yeah. of develop this Christian village type of ethos that I'm protected yeah. and loved. And I think there's a, a valuable part. I mean, I, I'm not, there's no disparaging yeah. that at all. I think where the struggle lies for us in the Missouri Synod maybe is, well, we've got a lot of churches in uh, places like LA where yeah. the Christians That's are not of the majority. And so the pastor better have a mission minded heart there to, to care for. And hopefully he, he's going to have developed some strong EQ skills to connect with people who have a persona of what a Christian pastor is. That is not ho hopefully who he's right. striving to be as he is seeks to understand wh what is the, how does the gospel impact this respective community? We should have so much grace for one another and therefore leaders should have so much kind of hopefully Holy Spirit inspired freedom and permission to, to raise up a number of different leaders to reach a number of different people. If I could say one thing about the ULC's mission is, well, two things, maybe one to know you're not alone. If you're a small church pastor and you're just trying to make it, there are people and resources that are maybe beyond your circuit in a wider network that you just need that love and care and encouragement. And so we're here to kind of connect, connect people. And, and two, then in the other side, so that's a humble, the one thing, I'd add is to challenge places of pride, individual and collective pride, where we think we figured it out. 
And therefore, being a Jesus follower or raising up leaders, it looks like this. No, nah, the church must adapt as we move into a post-Christian secular culture today. If we as the LCMS are going to be irrelevant at all, and I, this right. is the question mark. I don't know if some leaders in the LCMS want us to be relevant at all. I don't think relevance right. means. And when I say relevance, that's not compromising the gospel, Mark. That's just saying right. times have changed. Context has changed. What needs to stay the same? What do we agree on? And what must we be open handed with as we raise up leaders to reach diverse contexts today? That's that's it. That's any response to that, though, Mark? Let's go, let's just look at what we confess and believe as Lutherans. Og, the Augsburg Confession, uh, you know, it teaches very clearly, Article 7 of the Augsburg Confession, the church is defined by faith, not by ritual or rite. It's not by clothing, it's not by buildings. I'm paraphrasing a little, you know, but that's what it says. Wherever God's word is preached rightly and the sacraments are administered rightly, that is all that's essential. Yep. The reformers actually had a discussion of whether or not they'd be doing albs and stoles, as I understand, because they didn't want to be too closely connected to Rome for a minute there. You know, but they said, no, it's fine. Do albs and stoles. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. That's totally fine. We love the history of the church. I definitely do. But the fact of the matter is, wherever God's word is being preached rightly, the sacraments are being administered rightly. That is all that's essential. The promises in Jesus Christ are eternal, but God's communication methods and his styles are constantly changing. Give you one quick example. Ark of the Covenant, the manger. The manger to the cross. The cross to the empty tomb. Uh, Hebrew to Greek. Greek to Latin. Latin to German. German to Spanish. Spanish to English. Uh, the scroll to the codex or the book. The book to the printing press, the printing press to the radio, the radio to the television, the television to the iPhone. So there are all kinds of communication methods and styles that God can use to communicate with the wider church. The promises of Jesus are eternal in the gospel, but styles are constantly changing and our world is constantly changing. Tim, when I went to Germany, I did the Luther tour. It was fantastic. You know, I love German. I've been speaking German since I was a little boy with my grandpa. Right. But, um, you know, it's a little rusty right now, mm -hmm. but I need to get back on it. And, you know, going around Germany, I'm looking at these huge murals and I'm talking to our tour guide, Jan. And I'm like, when was this painted? There's Luther with Jesus and the disciples like, yes, it was during Luther's day. He was alive. He saw it. I believe he had that one commissioned. Oh, I have a lengthened. And I'm thinking, what would happen now? If we had like the president of a church body with a mural of him, like hanging out with Jesus and the apostles telling people about Jesus, you know, or a video of that. Oh, my gosh. People would be so upset. Yet Luther did stuff like that yeah. a lot. So, um, you know, uh, how do we relate the faith to the needs of the time? That is a confessional Lutheran, according to Herman Zazay. Yeah. Right. How do we relate the faith to the needs of the time? And to quote the great Bob Cole, I'm sorry, I'm bringing all this Lutheran stuff into it for people who aren't Lutheran That's watching great. this. Great. But a confessional, you cannot be confessional if you are not missional. And if you are not missional, you are not confessional. So if someone's confessing, that's pretty missional. And if they're missional, you're going to be confessing. That's right. So it depends on context. Don't criticize your brother for how he's doing ministry or his congregation is doing ministry in the Bronx compared to rural Nebraska, compared to Orange County. Trust them. Amen. Trust your brother. If you have a question or an issue, talk to them, reach out to them. But keep in mind, the church is defined by faith and not by right. Whatever God's sacraments are administered rightly. That's all that's essential. Amen. Hey, Mark, this has been so fun. Um, so final question. You also care about the CUS system. You mentioned you're a graduate of Concordia Ann Arbor. Yep. You like I, I was privileged to interview uh, Reverend Dr. Pat Ferry, and he was he was trying to give a little bit of context to what was going on. I'm grateful for the way um, the board of directors responded, yep. uh, praying for President Ankerberg and and the Concordia Ann Arbor team. Uh, shout out to Ryan, Ryan Peterson there and his wonderful, wonderful leadership. Um, I'm grateful that we have more time. But in the midst of this kind of short period of time, you you told quite a little fascinating story that got a little bit of traction on on. YouTube. 
YouTube as as well. So what compelled you to speak into the struggle and what are your thoughts coming out of the, the struggle now, Mark? Yeah, I couldn't stand by and not say something, Tim. Uh, Concordia University Ann Arbor is a fantastic institution. It's imperfect. I think to lose that university would be a tragedy. I also went to Concordia Seminary St. Louis. In some respects, going to Ann Arbor was almost more helpful than going to St. Louis in some ways, because I would be in my world religion class or New Testament class, and there were non-Christians in there. There were friends, wonderful people who are Muslim or Jewish or agnostic or atheist in that class with Christians. And we would have a devout teacher who had been a pastor for 10, 30, 40 years, fielding these questions thoughtfully, respectfully, talking with them, explaining the faith and relating the faith to the needs of the time. So in some ways, that was almost more helpful than being at St. Louis, because at St. Louis, I mean, everybody's a Christian, you know, everybody's trained to go into church work. And there was such diversity at Ann Arbor. And from my point of view, I'm a very historical person. And I know for a fact that none of these Concordias, none of these institutions were created with the purpose or the intention in mind, first and foremost, to make money. Now, you don't want to hemorrhage money. I understand that. But it's a mission of the church. And here we have this 187 acre property that is probably the best property, the most sought after property in Michigan. And we're talking about closing it over a four or five million dollar shortfall. That doesn't sound right to me. And I'm, I was concerned before all of this. How do we lose Selma? How do you let that happen? Our historical black college in Selma, Alabama, were professors there at one time marched with Dr. King. Concordia Portland, Concordia Bronxville. And now there's this weird thing with Concordia, Texas. Like, what is going on there? So I'm concerned. I don't think this is an issue of being conservative or progressive or traditional or contemporary. It's like, what is happening with our schools? And if we're just saying, well, you know, well, if they didn't do it this year, if they didn't close it this year, they just would have had to do it the next year. To me, that's a loser mentality of saying, well, we don't want to keep having to deal with this. No, a winning mentality is let's do the best we can do. Let's pray like everything depends on Jesus and work like everything depends on us, to quote the great Martin Luther. That's the spirit of Martin Luther. That's the spirit of Lutheranism of Christianity, being out in the world. We sing that old hymn and uh, it talks about the gates of hell not prevailing um, against the church, against Jesus's church. I'm guessing, Tim, if you took a poll of Christians in this country right now from Pew, you had a great research firm like Pew take a poll, they would say, a lot of people would probably say, well, that's an image of the church building a fort and hiding from the world and people are coming. No, that's an image of the church storming the gates of hell, the gates of Hades, storming things like human trafficking, storming things like partial birth abortion, storming things like women not being treated with respect and humanity. That's the image. The church going into a place, if a school is needed, they set up a school. If a hospital is needed, they set up a hospital, whatever it might be. And that's what Concordia University Ann Arbor, Michigan is doing in that place imperfectly. They are pointing people to Jesus. And that's what I see the Concordias in general doing. But what really sort of blows my mind, too, is to me, Ann Arbor out of all of our colleges, I think you can easily make the case it's the nicest campus. Campus that's mm -hmm. in the middle of things more than maybe any campus in the Concordia system. You know, maybe it's St. Louis or it's Irvine. I don't know, you know, but my goodness, how do you lose that ministry, that Christ-centered ministry in that place, in that time? Because it's not just about producing church workers, Tim. It's not just about that. Can I preach a little more? 
Yeah, Martin Luther go. said when he's lecturing on Genesis, he says, um, the most precious unit in the world, in society, is the family unit. And all other yes. units derived from that unit. Uh, educational units, artistic units, business units, so on and so forth. And they all should look like the family unit and serve the family unit. I am a child of God. I am a father. First of all, I'm a child of God. I'm a husband. I'm a father and then a pastor. I'm a child of God. I'm a husband. I'm a father, then a pastor. Always in that order, never out of that order. So being a child of God isn't so much a calling or a vocation as it is a gift. I'm gifted uh, life through Jesus Christ in the waters of holy baptism. So whether I'm in church work or not, my main vocation is to be a good spouse. My main vocation is to be a good parent and then be a pastor. So someone going there for business, the same applies to them. They're a child of God. A spouse, if God blesses them to be a spouse, a parent, if God blesses them to be a parent, and then a business person. We need ethical business people. We need people that are centered on Jesus and all of these vocations, whether they're a garbage person, whether they're a doctor, whatever they are. And I'm going to end with this, Tim. I'm going to end with this, man. I'm going to bring a little fire here. Maybe, just maybe, if a person's only connection to Lutheran education is one of the seminaries and maybe just maybe they think the only real church worker is someone who's a pastor and they're not real concerned about DCEs getting a good education or worship directors getting a good education. Teachers. Maybe you wouldn't really be that concerned about any of the Concordia undergrads. You'd only be concerned about the two seminaries. Maybe just maybe. Yeah. So I think that is sort of what's going on. I don't know for sure, but I kind of wonder. And church is yeah. not to hide from the world. Look at Bonhoeffer, look at Luther. They're out in the world. And we have those Please. gifts to reach the world. The world isn't bad. The world is good. It's a good place. Mark, I love the way the spirit of God rests upon you. Uh, you speak the truth from a place of love with Lutheran values especially your rant on vocation. I mean, no one can listen to that and say, Those guys are, no, 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 no. All different vocations mm -hmm. are honorable and uh, are necessary for fulfilling the ultimate building block of society, which is the, the family, where we can agree, I think, across whatever aisle you want to look at in the LCMS is the breakdown of the family mm -hmm. is not a good thing. Nope. And moms and dads need help raising godly children, uh, grandparents. We need you involved still. And we need healthy, Jesus-focused, kingdom-expanding business leaders who are ethical, who um, want to partner with the local church and the local church leaders want to learn with, with them. Like these should be things that we should agree on. We need one another. There's reciprocity. There's a mutual beneficial relationship that takes place. And unfortunately, so let me just get into two different points. Money is a real thing yeah. and higher education struggles are a real thing today. So for those of you who are in those leadership positions, we're praying for you. We're praying for wisdom. We're praying for creativity. We're praying that you hold certain things like the truths of scripture alone with a closed fist and then all other creative methods to reach people and to serve multiple vocations is fair game. And that if you're one of the leaders who are listening to this, who are going down a path of, of control and power, looking to sell off assets. Now, I don't know your heart. Only Jesus knows your heart. But if in the back of your mind, if you're in a leadership position, you're like, you know, the best thing for the LCMS would be one seminary and one Concordia University where we can tightly. Uh, puritanically kind of protect the mission of Christ connected to the LCMS. If that's your motivation, you are counter to the mission of God yeah. and the resources that he has given to Man. us today. And uh, I don't need to, this is, you will be judged. And I don't, I don't, this is God. This is God saying this leaders will be held more responsible. If your heart is to sell off assets to build whatever small little declining kingdom within the LCMS is, 
That's that's counter to the mission of Jesus is counter to the story of the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, and it is unfaithful to the generations who have come before us. And so, Mark, thank you for your your call, your desire to speak words of love and and truth. And uh, I'm grateful for the book, Curious Cases. Pick it up. You can find this book wherever it is, Mark. Um, where, where can people find this? Amazon, Amazon etc. You can find it, barnesandnoble.com. You can contact Width and Stock Publishing House directly. They're out of Eugene, Oregon. It's a small Christian publishing house. And I believe if you order four or more for your congregation or seminary, you can get like 25% off, something like that, if you order in a little bit of bulk. But you can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. Uh, whipsandstock.com, so on and so forth. It's so good. How can people connect with you, Mark, if they desire Absolutely. to? Absolutely. So you can check me out on my, I'm on YouTube. I'm on Facebook. Um, my YouTube handle and my Facebook handle uh, escaped me at the moment. I'm sorry. You can find sorry. fun uh, videos there. I've been to a lot of different countries. Check out stuff I did in Palestine or Greece or Israel or Rome or the Vatican or China or whatever, and also daily devotions there. And uh, yeah, you know, if you want to send me an email, if you're interested in anything I said, you know, I'll get my email address out on here. Uh, Mark right. J. Renner 87 at gmail.com. You can hit me up there and we can talk. Always happy. Amen. And I get a lot of emails myself from folks who may say, you shouldn't say mean things against institutional leaders. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, if we see something, it'd be unkind and unloving for us not to say something. Right. So all that to say, it's a good day. Go and make it a great day. Yeah. Jesus loves you very, very much. And we embrace difficult conversations here in the ULC. And Mark, uh, you have added to that conversation. You're a conversation partner filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's an honor to call you a brother in Christ. Lead time. We'll be back next week. Looking forward to it. Actually, two lead times being released every single week right now. So thank you so much, Mark. What hey, a joy. Thank you, Tim. God bless you. It's a great joy to be here. You've been listening to Lead Time, a podcast of the Unite Leadership Collective. The ULC's mission is to collaborate with the local church to discover, develop, and deploy leaders through biblical Lutheran doctrine and innovative methods. To partner with us in this gospel message, subscribe to our channel, then go to the UniteLeadership.org to create your free login for exclusive material and resources. And then to explore ways in which you can sponsor an episode. Thanks for listening and stay tuned for next week's episode.